So without further ado, uh, we get started uh, the session today, uh, our inaugural session with the European Renal Association uh, collaboration between GLAMCAN and ERA EDTA. Today's session is on picks of the new European Renal Best Practice Guidelines on Vascular Access. Our speaker is Dr. Socrates Stampos, Nephrology Registrar, Glasgow Renal and Transplant Unit, Queen's Elizabeth University Hospital, Glasgow, UK National Representative of uh, YNP. Our panelists are Dr. Karen Stevenson, consultant of transplant and vascular access surgeon, Glasgow Renal and Transplant Unit UK, Professor Mauricio Gallieni, Director of Nephrology Dialysis Unit and Associate Professor of Nephrology, El Sacco Department of Biomedical and Clinical Sciences, University of Milano, Italy, and Professor Jose Ibeas, Chair of the Spanish Guideline on Vascular Access, member of the Clinical Practice Guideline on Chronic Renal Disease Group of the Spanish National Health System, member of the European Vascular Access Guidelines of the ERA ADTA, and Vice President of the Spanish Multidisciplinary Group on Vascular Access, and President of the Vascular Access Society. And Dr. Farshid Yazdi, Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine, Nephrology Fellowship Associate Program Director and Medical Director, Oxnard Baptist Interventional Nephrology, Medical Director, the Vita Memorial Dialysis Unit, LSU Health Science Center, New Orleans. So, Socrates, please take us away. Thank you. So, yes. uh, so uh, yes, as Ali uh, said before, so my name is Socrates uh, and I'm a, a nephrology trainee in Glasgow and at the UK. Uh, and I have a special interest on vascular access and I've done my research on vascular access as well. So, the recommendations from the new uh, European Renal Best Practice Guidelines, which were published earlier this year. So, uh, there's actually quite a lot of uh, vascular access guidelines published recently uh, and uh, uh, a few of the people on the panel have been involved in them. So it's uh, first of all the Spanish uh, multidisciplinary group of vascular access published their guidelines in 2017. Uh, the European Society of Vascular Surgeons published uh, some other guidelines in 2018. And there are some uh, key doki clinical practice guidelines for vascular access uh, uh, which uh, we can actually see there's a draft available since April uh, 2019 with uh, an anticipated publication date of uh, late 2019. So there's a lot of movement uh, with guidelines in the vascular access field recently. With regards to the uh, ERPP guidelines, uh, uh, this was in collaboration uh, uh, with the Vascular Access Society, which is the European Society of Vascular Access. Uh, and uh, this, guide, this guideline essentially covers uh, aspects related to maturation and uh, maintenance of AV fistulas and grafts. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a second part uh, which is under development and will cover aspects related to access choice, to operative vessel assessment, and central venous catheters. And uh, to formulate this guideline, they have used the GRADE system, which stands for graded, Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And this is uh, the GRADE system. Uh, uh, so essentially in accordance with this system, the guideline development group initially uh, categorized the quality of the evidence for its outcomes as high if it, if it originated predominantly from randomized controlled trials uh, and low if it, uh, if it originated from observational data. And uh, they have actually two statements. One is a strong statement, uh, which actually is a recommendation, uh, which is a uh, and, and then a weaker statement, which is actually a suggestion based on the evidence available. So 32 graded uh, statements uh, uh, are included in these guidelines. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, there's no high uh, quality evidence. So there's zero of these statements uh, are based on level A evidence. Uh, 28 out of the 32, which is almost 88%, are based on low or very low quality evidence, and the rest four in a kind of medium quality evidence. And there are only five strong recommendations out of the 32, uh, and the rest are suggestions, uh, uh, and there are four which are undetermined. It's actually, it's, uh, it's specialist uh, advice. And this reflects the fact that the uh, high quality data on vascular access are scarce, partly because there are still uh, uh, too few, uh, there's not many sufficiently powered and well-designed controlled trials. Uh, 
I'll move to the uh, recommendations, first of all, with regards to medical treatments for promoting uh, AV fistula maturation. Uh, as I said, uh, I've picked up a few of them. I couldn't cover all the, uh, all the guidelines. So based on this uh, recommendation, any decision to give antiplatelets during the first two months after fistula creation for improving maturation must balance any reduction in thrombosis against uncertain effects on maturation and bleeding. Uh, so it's not only the bleeding, the problem, but also uh, there's equivocal effects on the maturation. Uh, and uh, uh, kind of clinical practice advice, they suggest that we should not stop mono antiplatelet treatment in adults uh, undergoing AV axis creation. Similar recommendations uh, were made for perioperative heparin, infrared therapy, warfarin uh, or other anticoagulants, free soil statin, and von in, 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 in with regards to a promotion of fistula maturation. Uh, and um, this is a meta-analysis uh, where they say this was mostly based showing that uh, antiplatelets, antiplatelet agents here uh, seem to reduce uh, thrombosis at eight weeks, uh, although the certainty of the evidence was uh, compromised by risk of bias. Uh, however, the effects on AV, on, on AV fistula uh, failure were uncertain, uh, as you can see by the confidence interval here. Um, moving on to the surgical and endovascular interventions for promoting fistula maturation, uh, there is a, a statement uh, which says that regional block rather than local anesthesia should be used for fistula in adults with uh, NCH renal disease. And this is based on five randomized controlled trials which compared regional versus uh, local site anesthesia. And uh, this is one of them. Uh, this was actually published in 2016. And uh, as you can see here, primary patency at uh, three months was higher in the branchial plexus block versus the local anesthesia. And uh, uh, this effect was greater uh, in the radiocephalic fistulas. Um, So with regards to perioperative prophylactic antibiotics for preventing uh, access infection, uh, this is a, a strong uh, recommendation. This is one of the, of the five strong uh, recommendations, which essentially suggests that preoperative antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended for, uh, for graft insertion. And this is based on two randomized control trials, uh, which indicated an average of five and 30% risk reduction uh, of, of infection. Both of them are quite old studies. Uh, this is one of them. Um, patients were randomized to either, to either uh, a single dose of uh, 750 milligrams of vancomycin six to 12 hours before uh, vascular access placement. Uh, this is group one. And uh, the rest were, were kind of the control group. And there was a uh, um, access infection developed in two patients in group one who had the antibiotics in 12 in patients who did not have the antibiotics uh, and the value was significant. And uh, there's another similar study uh, where this uh, guideline was actually based on. Uh, with regards to the, within the same uh, category with regards to prophylactic antibiotics, the, the suggestion is that uh, preoperative antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended for complex a AV access procedures. And uh, the, uh, they, they actually say that simple access procedures include the creation of native radiocephalic and native brachiocephalic and all the rest are considered to be complex. But this is all based on no evidence. There's lack of evidence for AB fistulas, no randomized control uh, trials, but this is, comes from extrapolation of evidence for antibiotics prophylaxis for preventing, uh, preventing surgical site infections in general. Um, another topic they've touched was the timing of the first cannulation. Uh, this is another strong recommendation and uh, based on that, AV fistula should not be cannulated uh, earlier than two weeks after creation. Uh, and this uh, guideline is based on eight observation studies. And uh, the larger one is the dialysis outcomes practice pattern study, which essentially showed uh, an increased risk of subsequent fistula failure for fistulas that uh, were cannulated early compared with the ones that were cannulated more than two weeks after creation. And this is uh, the relative risk of AV failure by timing of first cannulation. 
uh, this analysis included uh, 642 patients without prior uh, temporary access uh, formation. And uh, the relative risk was adjusted for age, sex, and 15 more uh, different classes of variables uh, reflecting comorbidity. This was the reference group here, uh, days 43 to 84. And uh, cannulation within the, four, the first uh, 14 days after creation was associated with a significantly increased risk of subsequent fistula failure. Uh, and uh, as you can see, there was no significant trend to decrease fistula failure uh, among cannulation intervals greater than 14 days. And again, from the same study, this is survival curves. Uh, for fistula cannulated either less than 14 days or uh, over uh, 14 days. Uh, and uh, uh, L cannulation was associated with a twofold increased risk of subsequent fistula failure versus cannulated uh, uh, over uh, 14 days. So, um, uh, these, uh, the next following uh, recommendations are actually. Uh, based on very weak evidence. Uh, the first one suggests that uh, fistula should be cannulated four weeks after creation if they're considered suitable for cannulation on clinical examination. And the third one is, says that uh, we should avoid cannulating fistulas between two and four weeks after creation unless there's an uh, immediate need for dialysis uh, and uh, this may precipitate placement of a central venous catheter. Uh, they also give an advice for clinical practice saying that uh, uh, we should use single knee dialysis, low dialysis blood flows and smaller needles uh, to prevent harm to the fistulas that are cannulated earlier. As I said earlier, there's weak evidence uh, and they actually uh, made these recommendations to, to, to allow, uh, to make people aware that fistulas should be allowed to, to mature a bit further. Uh, and uh, as we've shown in the study before, there was no difference uh, in uh, fistula outcomes uh, or the fistula cannulated before or after the 28 uh, days anyway. Um, moving on with, uh, with the grafts, again, a strong recommendation. So early cannulation type grafts uh, can be cannulated as soon as healing permits. And uh, again, there's no randomized control data. Uh, but there's a sub-analysis of a prospective multi-center study which showed no difference between early, which was less than 72 hours, and late, which was more than 21 days uh, with early cannulation devices. Uh, and this is the study, so it's a, a prospective multi-center study, including 87 patients. Uh, all of them had a multi-layer graft designed for early cannulation. Uh, in the first couple major car curve, uh, we can see the primary unassisted patency for up to 12 months. In patients in whom the graft was uh, first cannulated, either uh, less, less than three days or more than 21 days after implantation. And uh, there was actually no meaningful difference uh, in cumulative graft uh, rates. And similarly, this is a so that's the unassisted patency, and that's a cumulative patency. So similarly, this is the, uh, the, the graph of the patients uh, uh, who was. Uh, uh, here, the, the graph was cannulated less than three days, and the, the graph was cannulated after 21 days against no difference in cumulative uh, graph patency rates. Um, with regards to the standard types, uh, type grafts, uh, uh, this should not be cannulated sooner than two weeks after insertion, unless, again, this would precipitate the placement of a, uh, of a catheter. Um, and uh, there are three studies uh, that this uh, recommendation was based on. Um, and uh, uh, which compared standard grafts cannulation before and after 14 days. And uh, in two of them, the, over the overall risk of graft failure was, did not differ uh, between the two groups, but the third study found the uh, secondary patency rates up to 15% lower in grafts cannulated early versus the grafts that were cannulated after the 14 days. And that's actually the study uh, mostly contributed to this uh, recommendation. Uh, another hot topic with the regards to vascular access surveillance, uh, um, the evidence for surveillance in addition to clinical monitoring of a functional fistula to detect and pre preemptively correct uh, uh, an important stenosis is inconclusive. So essentially, uh, uh, there's no recommendation based on that. Uh, but uh, there is a suggestion against surveillance in addition to clinical monitoring of a functional graph 
for a detection of preemptive correction of a significant stenosis unless it occurs in the context of a clinical study. And uh, both of these uh, recommendations are mostly based on, uh, on a Cochrane uh, review on the topic, uh, which was published uh, uh, almost three years ago. Uh, and uh, they've actually compared preemptive versus uh, a different correction of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of stenosis. Uh, and uh, in, in, this, uh, um, in this graph, we can see the axis loss by axis type. These are for the face loss and this is for the grafts. And um, although uh, there was a small, uh, uh, th th there was a signal towards uh, a favored uh, preemptive um, uh, correction and uh, surveillance and face loss, this was not shown in the grafts. Uh, but uh, uh, the, this, uh, the, there was actually a substantial increase up to 80% uh, in the use of access related procedures to achieve that. And uh, this was associated with procedure-related adverse events such as infections and mortality. So essentially, the group concluded that uh, the net effects of preemptive correction are unclear and unbalanced. Uh, they, they don't make any recommendations. Medical treatments for maintaining long-term AV access patency. Um, uh, it's, uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, recommendation. Is, uh, uh, Far infrared therapy may be considered for improving uh, long term therapy. And uh, uh, again, this is based on this study, which was published a couple of years ago. And uh, sorry. Um, yes, that, that was published a couple of years ago and uh, showed that the infrared therapy seemed to increase primary patency. Uh, at 12 months and decreased um, AV fistula occlusion rates uh, um, again. So this, uh, based on this uh, infrared therapy may, may be useful for fistula maturation. Moving on with regards to medical treatments for maintaining long-term AV, uh, AV access patency, uh, against looking at uh, factors like aspirin uh, or antiplatelets uh, uh, and uh, and similar. So again, a strong recommendation which uh, they recommend against combining high dose aspirin and clopidogrel or warfarin in that platelet agents in patients with uh, arteriovenous grafts. And this is based on two randomized control trials that found no improvement in graft outcome but had to be terminated early for excessive bleeding risk. Both of them have now been published more than 15 years ago and they were both published in Jason. So uh, in the uh, here on the left, you can see uh, the, the couple of major graphs for aspirin propylogrel versus placebo. Um, the incidence uh, of uh, bleeding events was significantly greater for aspirin propylogrel compared to placebo. And uh, in the second uh, graph, uh, this is the cumulative incidence of first graph thrombosis, and there was no significant difference between the two groups. And with regards to warfarin, Again, similarly, essentially, uh, what they have shown here is that uh, um, less patients in the placebo group, uh, which is here experienced graft loss, so the odds ratio was uh, in favor of uh, placebo, and at the same time, five patients, which was 11% of the participants from warfarin, had severe bleeding, including upper GI bleeding and cerebral bleeding. All, all five of them, though, were concurrently treated with antiplatelet agents. Uh, uh, so uh, finally, this is uh, uh, this is the last uh, recommendation that uh, I touched. Uh, so uh, and this is also a strong one. Uh, and based on that, uh, they discourage the use of blind needles except for bottom hole cannulation of AV fistulas. And uh, this is mostly based on one randomized control trial, including 35 participants and a total of uh, 30, 335 dialysis sessions, which directly compared uh, sharp versus blind needles. And um, uh, the authors comment uh, on the fact that there was an uh, important carryover between the interventions, uh, uh, which made inference particularly challenging. Uh, but overall, uh, the difference in failed cannulation was not uh, statistically significant for the downstream needle, as you can see here. Uh, but for the upstream needle, uh, there was, uh, uh, so blunt needle resulted in cannulation failure more frequently than a sharp needle, as you can see here, and this was statistically significant. Uh, 
and there were no uh, many, there was no significant differences in implant pain, bleeding time, or infection uh, between the two treatment groups. And I think that's the last one. Thank you very much for your attention and. Uh, um, Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stampos. That was a great introduction to the uh, latest uh, guidelines. Perhaps uh, the first uh, question to uh, Dr. Uh, Gallieni. Uh, can you, so uh, Socrates briefly mentioned that there are several um, access uh, vascular dialysis, vascular access guidelines out currently K Doki, K Digo, um, uh, European vascular access guidelines, the Spanish uh, society. So what are, the, what are the main differences and if we can highlight the key aspects moving forward, what, why do we have so many different uh, guidelines and what are the strong differences and, and uh, important aspects to consider with hymnals? Uh, yes, I'll be glad to answer this question because uh, um, I think uh, uh, it is very good that we have more than one uh, uh, guideline which came out uh, basically at the same time uh, because there are uh, big differences. So um, the EDTA guidelines are uh, the first part of a larger number of uh, uh, PICO questions. So these are the questions that are supposed to be answered uh, following the grade system. So uh, you, ans you, you have to consider P as patients, so the patient population, uh, for example, uh, uh, considering one of the cases that uh, we just saw, um, uh, the patients are the, um, dialysis patients with uh, an AV graft and you want to understand if uh, antibiotic prophylaxis uh, is uh, actually useful. So intervention is the, the use of antibiotic versus the comparator is a population without the use of antibiotic. And then O stands for outcome and you understand what happens. So in order to approach the guidelines following this kind of uh, method, um, you need to have very good uh, uh, clinical study, possibly uh, randomized control study or in some cases observational studies. So this kind of limited uh, the number of recommendations that you can give. So if you compare this new approach compared to the previous CDTA guidelines from 2007, it's completely different. At that time, guidelines were kind of the ideal uh, treatment that uh, either based on evidence or on uh, expert opinion, you had to, to uh, consider and, and aim to. Uh, while right now, uh, you can only give guidelines if you have data. And uh, um, it was a difficult pathway within the European best practice guidelines. It took a long time because we started in 2013. And then we decided to go on with the AV access and leave the catheter guidelines for a second uh, uh, run. So we, I will expect that maybe next year or in two years, uh, we will also have the possibility to complete the catheter guidelines. Uh, when you compare the other available guidelines, which are the European Society of Vascular Surgery, these were not done with the GRADE system. They follow the European Society of Cardiology approach, basically still based on evidence, but uh, um, there were no PICO questions. Uh, and, and therefore, um, also, the, um, the approach is a little different because although there were representatives from nephrology and interventional radiology, the ESVS, the European Society of Alcohol Surgery, are mainly based on the work of uh, surgeons. Um, and some of them are uh, very simple recommendations, uh, like uh, you have to prefer an AV fistula to a, an AV graph of a catheter, which is largely accepted. And, but, but that's not based really on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the studies that are available because there are no randomized trials of, of catheters versus uh, fistulas of graphs, not yet. Dr. Ravani from uh, Canada tried to do a study like that, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, the study is proceeding. Uh, then we have the Spanish guidelines, which were very well done uh, with a very broad approach. And this was, uh, following the GRAY system with the um, uh, Spanish uh, uh, group of the Cochrane uh, 
So also methodologically, and maybe Jose Beas, uh, who is now in the panel, can comment on that. And they approach uh, basically every aspect of vascular access. And that is very different from the European best practice guidelines with kind of focus on, on specific issues. And then uh, finally, and I conclude because I'm taking too much time, uh, the, um, the KDOKI guidelines, which are going probably to be published on the American Journal of Kidney Disease by uh, the um, uh, American Society of Nephrology meeting, so by the end of the year, probably November, uh, kind of change the focus of uh, the approach to the patient. So they are, um, their aim was to make a patient-centered uh, um, set of guidelines. So they started from the previous guidelines that, that were available for KDOKI and they expanded it a lot, but also they put that in a different perspective. So they first say, we have to understand which is the life plan of the patient considering the kind of uh, treatment for end-stage kidney disease, which is either peritoneal dialysis or uh, hemodialysis or conservative treatment. And then based on that, you decide what kind of access you can uh, um, decide to, to uh, prepare in the specific patients. And the same applies to uh, management of complications. Uh, what, uh, uh, according to the KDOKI guidelines, uh, you should always keep in mind is uh, um, uh, the patient status uh, and uh, how the intervention will affect that based on the preference of the patient and, uh, uh, and the outcomes that uh, are closely related to uh, the comorbidities and, and the patient status. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gallieni. Uh, Dr. Ibeas, any thoughts, comments on that? Well, I think that uh, good evening to all of you uh, and to all the audience. It's a pleasure to be here with you with Fantastic Initiative. Well, uh, I think that Mauricio had made a fantastic review of the main issue related with the difference uh, of the guidelines. Uh, I'm not, not going to say uh, a lot of new things in relation of the Mauricio comments. Perhaps I can highlight a little the Spanish guidelines in relation to the others. But the main ideas is, is are the ideas exposed by Mauricio. That means that all of them have the same grid system, but uh, probably, although the methodologies have made a lot of work, also it's important the work of the experts. And this is very important because uh, the European Society of Vascular Surgery uh, guidelines, they are made for a focus for vascular surgeons, but the methodology is completely different to the credit system. And so this sometimes can have some kind of influence in the recommendations. Second, the DOCI guidelines, uh, our credit system, are focused in the quality of evidence of all the recommendations, but uh, the philosophy is completely different because they focus the importance in the status of the patient. That means the right access for the right patient, the right time, uh, in order to take account the lifeline of the patient. And this is quite good for the, uh, for the context of the vascular access because sometimes if we only focus in the vessels and we don't take into account all the environment of the patient, sometimes we can make over-treatment or infratreatment. But uh, oh, um. I think we lost you, Dr. Ibias. Uh, not sure whether it was uh, this is now your audio or or the internet connection just completely gone. Um, okay, can I step in and, and add one more thing uh, regarding the questions of the European Best Practice Guidelines? Uh, I think uh, a very important uh, part of the work that was done in the preliminary part was to choose the, the questions that should be addressed. So uh, what we did, and we also published that, uh, and, then I, and then I can send you exactly the, the reference, uh, but uh, we made uh, um, a Delphi interview uh, among uh, patients uh, and uh, health personnel, so nephrologists and uh, surgeons and radiologists and nurses, uh, just to have a, a grade of the importance of the specific question. And, uh, and that is why uh, how the, the, the question were chosen. So in a way also, 
the European best practice guidelines uh, uh, put uh, the, the people at the center by choosing uh, the questions that were considered more important uh, to uh, each stakeholder in the field. But uh, that was not uh, then uh, included in the final um, uh, outline of, of the guidelines that were published in NDT. Uh, but still, uh, uh, in a way, there, there is some kind of um, common uh, uh, aim between the European Best Practice Guidelines and the KDOKI. And also the recommendations, when uh, I talked to uh, Dr. Chairman Locke from Toronto, who is the chairwoman of the um, uh, KDOKI guidelines, uh, she told me she was very glad to see that, uh, for example, there was a recommendation against, against monitoring uh, um, uh, graphs, which is uh, quite uh, rather a common uh, practice, uh, uh, but uh, is, is not useful. So she was afraid that uh, that could be different what came out from their analysis and our analysis, but considering that we based our decisions on the same studies, it was very good that uh, we ended up uh, without uh, having a, a comparison before that, we ended up with the same recommendation. Great, thank you. And perhaps we can uh, we can take this uh, this one issue of graft surveillance and and get actually to the issue of the of of, of the, the surgical perspective, perhaps by Dr. Stevenson, and and how how much uh, the actual practical needs are met uh, based on the evidence. And I think also perhaps uh, the a variation of these guidelines are also due to geographical regional differences in practice pattern, but also I think maybe pattern of reimbursement, uh, these type of things kind of creep into the, uh, to the decision making, uh, whether you are uh, perhaps reimbursed for a procedure you do or, or not incentivized and those things. So Dr. Stevenson, uh, from your perspective as the surgeon, uh, tell us about that. So, so I think it's interesting because when it comes to the guidelines, the levels of evidence are not high and I think that's demonstrated ac across lots of aspects of it. I think what's a useful thing as guidelines is that they can demonstrate areas for research in the future and I actually think there are significant limitations to the evidence that we have on grafts so whilst I think it's fair to say that the evidence is not good for graft surveillance at the minute I think it's unfair to recommend against it completely. I think when you come back to look at the data that exists for graft surveillance, whenever you look at the populations that were treated and the interventions that are performed, a lot of those inter interventions are based on angioplasty only. And those aren't the procedures that are now available to our patients. And there's certainly evidence that come from SAP and Desai in the States, um, evidence that's come from our group here where Actually, we have evidence that graft surveillance may have a role to play. Now, I agree that the benefit of this to be done in randomized trials is the way forward. And I think as a community, those trials need to be supported. Um, but to absolutely negate something with the evidence that is available and the populations in which they've been studied is not totally fair so i'm being a little controversial yeah let, let me go back to this issue i i think that uh, uh she what she said is very important actually and i want to clarify that the recommendation is not against any kind of surveillance uh, it was against uh, um, a, a preset like monthly or every month um, measurement of blood flow with uh, with Doppler ultrasound. So clinical um, surveillance uh, is the basis of that. So we we should do clinical surveillance. So if we see that there is uh, there are problems with the with the access uh, with increased pressures so with bleeding at the end of dialysis, and that is something that should prompt an uh, uh, ultrasound examination and to treat. Uh, uh, um, um, a stenosis if, if it is clinical significant. The problem is that by doing a, a systematic control, you might do unnecessary procedures uh, just because you see a, 
a reduction in uh, in the diameter of the uh, of the graft uh, if that has no clinical implication that you might doubt that in, in some cases and in some part of the world uh, somebody could be tempted to do the procedure because uh, you will get more money out of that without a, a real clinical um, advantage so that should be definitely be further studied so i don't think that uh, the question is uh, over uh, but apparently based on the data that we have on the systematic surveillance uh, there is no big advantage but clinical surveillance and intervention uh, i think is recommended maybe that is not clear enough based on uh, on what is uh, has been put into into the guidelines. I don't know if you agree about this. Um, I, I agree to, to some to, to extent. I think our knowledge of the natural history of stenosis is still evolving. I think also that the interventions that we have now are not those that were studied in this in the papers in the past. And so some more recent studies that have looked at either a primary stent graft approach or um, looking at those who have um, uh, actually not thrombosograft or those who've had thrombosis, there are very different outcomes in those two groups. And many of the previous studies have actually combined them all in one group. The other difficulty is that we know that grafts who accumulate stenosis or accumulate hepatitis of the thrombosis do worse. And we don't know if preventing those in the first place actually adds, adds to graft longevity. And there are definite questions to be looked at this in the future. Great, thank you much. And and speaking of uh, ge uh, geographic variation and practice patterns uh, across different countries, Dr. Yazdi, what is your uh, practice like in, in, in your access clinic? Do you have set uh, schedules for access surveillance uh, independent of clinical presentation or how, is, how you go about that? Well, we really appreciate the uh, patient-centered approach on each of these accesses, treating each of them as, uh, as its own entity. And, uh, for example, a patient who has recurrent thromboses or recurrent stenoses, we don't necessarily take them in for an immediate procedure, but may do surveillance with an ultrasound to assess for stenoses if they develop these recurrent issues over time. Um, you know, th there is, again, a life expectancy of a graph, for example. So at some point we do, um, you, you know, stop doing uh, interventions uh, on those accesses. But I think surveillance is something that, that needs to continue to be look at, looked at um, from a clinical standpoint. We try to do what's best for the patient and make sure that if we do expect uh, issues uh, and we see clinical evidence of stenosis or, or, or uh, impending thromboses, of course, some of these graphs develop thromboses without any warning signs. That seems to be the trend around here. So to prevent that ultimately is, is a great thing because you know, that is the lifeline. That's, that's what we're trying to ultimately preserve so that they can uh, achieve adequate dialysis. So, um, I, I, I think that's a key point, actually. The, the aim is to try to maintain things as well as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you have a cohort of studies that have looked at a lot of prevalent grafts who've had previous interventions, who've had previous thrombosis, it doesn't give you a clear picture of whether or not your sets of surveillance or your set of interventions helpful. And so you have to come right back to the P of the population that um, Dr. Galini was talking about. And the population is really important. And the difficulty for access studies is to recruit a coherent population and preferably an incident population that you can test this in. Because as soon as you bring prevalent patients into this, it muddies the, the question that you're trying to answer. It doesn't mean right. that you can't use this in prevalent patients, but it does confuse the issue. And giving you a little bit more of a geographical perspective, we do have about a 30% graft prevalence here. And so it may be a little bit higher than some places. Um, I, I know some parts of northern Mississippi, for example, there is vascular surgeon. There's a vascular surgeon there who has about a 90% fistula rate. 
So it, it can be widely variable in terms of the geographic, geographical um, uh, distribution. Thank you. Uh, not, not, to, not to stick on that uh, issue uh, for too long, but perhaps one general comment and then we can move on to the next controversy or to the next important part to, for people to take home. I also see Dr. Ibeas is with us again. So you know, the, the, the issue in particular with vascular access and dialysis patients, the, the, the notion of patient-centered uh, individualized uh, targeted care this this all is like the ideal and then sounds great but kind of it, it risks uh, falling into um, kind of an arbitrary expert opinion individual preference local center surgeon experience clinician experience type of thing so I, I does that, if we emphasize that too much, uh, is that not, does it not risk to be, to take us back where we were actually? Yes, I think this is the point really. Uh, first, if you're seeing the, for the same, uh, for the same pathology, like stenosis and surveillance, uh, the different guidelines make different recommendations, as you see. For instance, surveillance for ABF, you see that the vascular surgery guidelines or Spanish guidelines will recommend to me surveillance. The European guidelines and the doctor guidelines uh, have inconclusive results in order to recommend anything and are the same patients in the same centers. This is in a general point of view. In this context, uh, if we have to add the opinion of the expert in, with the patient that how to take the decision of the pipeline of the patient relation to the expectation of life, the life expectancy, the vessels, the air condition, the comorbidity, and so on. Uh, this, in a fantastic world, probably it would be very easy to take a decision with common sense. The problem is that if in different countries, in different guidelines, we have different opinions, if we add the different context of different experts, different clinicians, in different behaviors, with different reimbursement, with different uh, approach it depending on your devices and so on, probably the indications can be very, very different. And this is uh, our real world data. We are going to work with the same patient probably in different countries, but if we have sometimes different indications of the guidelines and this contains different kinds of opinions and different indi indications depending on the inter interpretation of what is a right patient, a right arm, a right conditions, then probably this is that this idea situation sometimes could be very difficult to translate to the clinical practice. So uh, it's, I think it's going to be very difficult to answer this question because we have to think that we, have, we are going to have a common sense uh, uh, conditions to take this uh, kind of answers. But the problem probably is that first of all, we have to have some clinical indications uh, and without forget these clinical indications after uh, take the patient in the context where we have to take the decision of the right patient, the right uh, conditions, and so on. I have one other comment just that comes along those lines is that when it comes to renal replacement therapy and we talk about access and we put the guidelines out, transplant sits there and the approach that the Scottish Renal Registry has taken is to including vascular access information but also include prevalent transplant rates um, in our reporting of the percentages of patients with different renal replacement therapies and the access that you will be able to create for someone is totally influenced by your country your geography your unit's transplant rate because most of the patients you're transplant have to get forward access options um, and what you can manage to create will vary depending on your, your, your country's transplant rate as much as anything else. That's a very important point and perhaps may take us to the next issue. And I open it up to the panel. Please uh, come uh, forth with any question you may have. Unmute yourself. I have one question. Dr. Stevenson, how much are you frustrated with us sending your patients for fistula placement when there is clearly kind of suggestion that fistula will not succeed in those patients? I think you approach, as we said before, you approach the patient 
from the start. And my first question in my access clinic is, are you on a transplant list or do you have a live donor? That's the first off. The second thing when from an access point of view is we routinely map, map patients and we try and create the optimal access for that patient. Now, someone may be willing to have two operations in the transposition or one larger one. Um, we have some patients who will go straight to graft if they have very, very poor native options. The legacy of previous access decisions comes into that. Um, and I don't think there are very few people who you cannot get any access on, but it does take creative thinking, assessment of central veins and consideration of upper and lower limb options for some people. But I think if you approach it with that mindset, with what the patient is prepared to accept in terms of operative intervention, then things are definitely possible. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yazdi, you just mentioned that uh, just across the state border in Mississippi, there is a group with 90% fistula rate and here there. We often here in US, uh, uh, we are lagging far and beyond behind the European colleagues with regards to fistula placement. Our fistula rates have been at this small We and always throw hands up and say, well, that's our patient. They are different. So yeah. just coming out, I personally admit that I don't think that's the case. I think there are other mechanisms, but I'm not the expert here and I'm not the surgeon placing them. What do you think uh, are the issues and, and, and uh, why, why are there so much variations? Oh, I hope that there's not a commercial interest as to why these, these surgeons are placing grafts as opposed to uh, autologous fistula. Um, and Could I, and be just I also cultural. Uh, and, oh, and, and maybe cultural. And, um, for, for example, why does Japan have 90% fistula rate? Because they don't transplant people. <laughs> well, they have a really low transplant rate. Really low transplant rate. They have to dialyze people for a long time. Right. But why not grafts as opposed to fistula? Yeah, but I think that uh, probably it's very difficult to interpret this because even in the United States, there's a completely important difference in fistula prevalence in different regions in Spain too, in Europe too. So probably the comorbidity of the patient is a factor to have lower level of ADF. Sure. But uh, in the same country, like the States, in Spain, in Europe, there's completely different ratio of ABF and graft. And this is a point because uh, sometimes it's not only reimbursement or mapping and so on, it's probably the protocol. And this is important because if, for instance, in the United States, you are going to have important difference in fistula prevalence, then how are going to indicate a fistula in an open-minded way where you have to choose the right patient with the right ABF and so on with so much big difference uh, in this uh, environment. So in, even in Spain, Spain we have huge difference between the north and the south or even in the same village, in the same city, it, it depending on the hospital. So probably we have to differentiate one is uh, try to use the protocol as better as we can and in parallel the, see the, what about the, the, the whole patient probably. Right, I, I agree that there's also a wide variability in terms of comorbidities. That probably makes a big difference in terms of, you know, there's a high prevalence of diabetes and hypertension here and the poorly controlled chronic illnesses that may also affect uh, their vasculature and I wish that I could be in the OR as the surgeons are placing these accesses to give them a little bit of guidance or help, although I know they probably know better than I do. But the point is, uh, I think that some surgeons, for example, don't do vein mapping. They believe to go, they, they can go straight into the operating room and find a, an artery, find a vein and connect the two. Fine, you feel confident in doing that. But, it, you know, it, they're, there's a variability in terms of how vein mapping should be done as well. I think Dr. Arbias has a, a great paper discussing ultrasounds and vein mapping and, and uh, the correct way to go about doing that. I'm not so sure that that is as um, uh, protocolized as it should be as well. So there might be some differentiation in terms of the workup as well as different surger, surgical methodology in terms of going straight to the OR versus 
pre-planning the vasculature before they uh, I think it's a it's a very brave surgeon who doesn't pre-plan their operation. I, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know why they do that, but some surgeons do that. The, I, th I think it's interesting. I think you have to have a discussion with what you're trying to achieve for your patient, and if they have potential live donors in six months' time, then the discussions that you have might be very different. You might end up discussing peritoneal dialysis or you know, a short-term graft if they don't have good options. Some people have complete surgical fatigue of multiple failed autologous attempts and really would like something that they'll be able to use that night and early cannulation graft can, can give you that. The, the balance of these is where they're trying to get to and the longevity that they require from it. Um, and some of that comes back to whether or not they're transplantable. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. If, if a transplant is an option, I ask all of my patients, do you have a, a potential live donor? That's a great option to start with. Um, and if I had a choice to preserve vasculature, I would also consider starting most of my patients on peritoneal dialysis, at least for a couple of years to get them started, plan, plan for a fistula if, if possible, and then go from there. Thank you. May, may I go back to the to the issue of the differences and specifically to Japan? It's true that they don't have transplant, but they don't have PD as well. Uh, and but they do uh, dialyze all the patients. The prevalence is very very high. So they have patients with good veins and bad veins, and uh, the prevalence of 95% of an AV fistula has different reasons. One of them is that uh, they don't need high blood flows. So it's very common in Japan to have a blood flow during dialysis of 200 ml per minute, 220, at most 250. Uh, and then, uh, uh, for example, even in cases where there is a clear indication to a catheter, like a patient with a severe heart failure, let's say an ejection fraction of 20%. So we would just not put an AV access in a patient like that. So what do we do in Japan? they do a superficialization of the radial artery and they put two needles, one directly in the artery and the other one in the vein without an AV fistula. And this is quite common. It's not a, a single case report. I, saw, I think there is a paper describing something like an experience of 70 out of them. So this is just give you the idea of the cultural approach. They just want to avoid the catheters at any cost. <coughs> And they use, small, they use small needles. They use mostly plastic needles with a 17 gauge size. So they, they can dialyze with uh, uh, AV access that uh, in our countries would not be uh, um, uh, enough, good enough to, to perform a regular dialysis session. Uh, and uh, I think that the most important point here is the organization of the vascular access uh, uh, center or or team. If uh, uh, a single nephrologist just signs a prescription or tells the patient, go to the surgeon and get an AV access without talking to the surgeon, of course, it is possible that that patient uh, uh, is feeling that uh, is entitled to have an access, but maybe there are contraindications. So every case should be uh, discussed and every case um, they should have a preliminary evaluation of the vessel by ultrasound. I think that would be good practice and uh, just to decide uh, which is the right patient and which is the right access as the KDOKI line guidelines are, are trying to address. And waiting time also is the last point, which I think is very important. So if I have a patient with an AV fistula and with thrombosis, uh, and I have a system that will allow me to have uh, uh, an intervention within 24 or 48 hours, then of course my fistula rate will, will be higher rather than in a situation when the, the first uh, possibility to intervene is after one week and maybe with a new access rather than taking that access. And the same applies for patients that have to start dialysis. So if I know the patient is closing uh, to the time of, uh, of starting dialysis and I can have an access uh, right away, it's probably going to be much better than uh, uh, waiting time is three, 30 days or even more in some cases. Okay. I'm, I'm totally agree, I am totally agree with Mauricio in relation 
that one of the main points in vascular access is not writing in guidelines because one of the main issues is organization. It's curious, see, how the protocols in uh, coronary artery disease are very similar all over the world. In inflama inflammatory bowel disease, common. Vasculitis, the same all over the world. But in vascular disease, although we have a uh, important amount of guidelines, are different all over the world. In this context, in uh, any specific, any, any specialty like cardiology, you have different professionals in different areas. But in nephrology, for instance, you have people for transplant, for dialysis, for PD, but perhaps you have nobody for uh, vascular access creation or follow-up. In the vascular surgery teams, you have a lot of people dedicated to carotid, to aorta, but perhaps there is no people that wanted to work in vascular access. In radiology, the same. Then in a context where you have different practices all over the world, different recommendation guidelines, and there is no people dedicated in all the vascular access teams with the same level that other pathologies, we are going to have a problem. Sometimes the problem is the management of the hospitals and the fault of this, the guilty probably we are the, are the nephrologists because if we have problems of a huge queue waiting for the vascular access creation, problems for devices for surveillance, problems for uh, bacteria for catheters, and we don't complain to the management of the hospitals, we are going to be the last in the queue. And this is probably a problem for organization. And this is important because, for instance, in the United States, we have the highest devices, the highest level of technology, but 80% of the patients start by catheter. In, a, in my country, for instance, we have difference, uh, difference ratio of uh, thrombosis of fistula that with surveillance goes from 0 0.02 thrombosis per patient year to other higher ratio, depending on the organization of the, of the vascular system. So I mean, as Mauricio said, that probably one of the main issues if the protocol, the organizations, and all the referral teams should have some kind of coordinator in order, perhaps only uh, as simple as read the guidelines, whatever you have in your hands. I think it's I think that's key. The organization of access in Scotland was hugely variable. And actually there was a project undertaken to look at each unit and go and speak to them and see what worked in each unit. And each of them were very different, all had strengths, all had weaknesses but there was a National Vascular Access Appraisal Project that took place that's been published in the, the JBA that basically looked at all of the things that made something good. And there is a scorecard within it that you can use for your own institution to look at that allows us and has certainly allowed us to look at our weaknesses, to try and build those up, to try and get that entire team working together. So it's key to your outcomes. I agree. Teamwork is the only way to uh, ha be successful in this uh, realm. You know, I, for example, I may have at any time 10 to 15 patients who require some sort of access in the near future. If I refer the patient to the surgeons and they plan to see them in four weeks and place the access six weeks later, uh, that's not going to work. I need it two weeks ago. Uh, so communication is key in having a coordinator. At least through L at LSU, we've been having some success in terms of getting access is placed a little bit sooner. Um, but that communication is key. For, for this reason, uh, when we were, we, were, we were writing the guidelines, and sometimes, in some ways, we thought that perhaps the backward system with the coordinator was wonderful. Sometimes we have a second doubt, because perhaps you think you have a fantastic coordinator, fantastic team, and you think that you work very well. But if you have not quality indicators, some kind of a score, you know, how do you work, you are going to have a problem. Because sometimes you think that you have the worst of the scenarios, and you are quite good. In a reversal situation, but then you, you think that you're very good and it's not. For the reason we work it a lot in create quality indicators for any, any part of all the chapters in order to audit our results. Although you can change every, every two years or three years the quality indicators, but you need a start point. For instance, there is a problem with uh, antibiotic lock and catheters in a lot of uh, facilities where my colleagues uh, put antibiotic log in catheters. The question is, do you know your basal ratios of bacteremia? Because perhaps you don't need this kind of antibiotic log that is not recommended by guidelines. In relation to the cues, the thrombosis ratio and so on, the question is, uh, if I have a high thrombosis ratio and I have a fantastic vascular access scheme, perhaps I need more surgeons, then I can go to my vascular, to my manager of my hospital and ask for more, for more resources. What I mean, finally, is that as important as the vascular system is some kind of scores or quality indicators to audit our results.
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibeas. Um, and and perhaps we are pressed for time. It's 9 a.m. I think uh, you uh, kind of communicated in the, the extract of it coming through that there is still much needed uh, in vascular access realm, uh, perhaps looking forward to not only research, but also just organizing the, the various uh, organizations and, and key uh, experts and opinion leaders in that to have a more coherent and com comprehensive and conclusive guidelines. So. Uh, Maybe maybe three more minutes is squeezing into it by uh, Dr. Gallieni. Can you give us five take-home messages from uh, these guidelines today? Five key highlights. Uh, well, I can try. Uh, one is that um, uh, we have now um, uh, new indications that uh, are useful for clinical practice, and uh, it, it will uh, be important uh, to better know them and I, I thank you very much for putting vascular access in the Glomcon uh, program in this regard. The second one is that the evidence is low so uh, I think this is a clear message to the vascular access and the nephrology and surgery and interventional radiology community that we should do much more Okay, we lost. We lost Dr. Gallinini. Dr. Ibias, take us through it. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, tell me, tell me, please. Are you, I can hear you. Tell me again. Uh, we, we missed Dr. Gallieni. He was taking us through, giving us the five highlights of, of the key, key take-home messages. Um, what should, what should the, the practicing nephrologists take home from uh, the session today to implement and, and help their patients? Well, I think that the first point should be before, when you read the guidelines, you should never forget to read the methodology. This is as important as recommendations. Second, uh, when we read the recommendations, we have to read the rationale in order to understand how has been made the recommendations. Because when you are going to read the American guidelines, the European, the surgery, the Spanish guidelines, you are going to see for the same pathology, different recommendations. And the only way, the only way to understand what is the reason of different recommendations is the rationale and the context. Mm -hmm. Uh, the more important point is that we always have to think in a multidisciplinary way because sometimes if the guidelines came from nephrology, from surgery and so on, sometimes the indications can be different. For this reason, we always have to think that we have to take the recommendations to the upfield that is not the same where the guidelines were written. So, multidisciplinary. And the last one should be always think in all the results. Like I told you before, is in relation to quality indicators in order how do you work. Well, finally, I would like to highlight that with this kind of different recommendations, different guidelines from the Vascular Society, we would like to work sometimes, perhaps, in uh, thinking that we sometimes we need some kind of help in order to join or to put together the different recommendations of different guidelines in the same country. So we would like to work uh, probably with different societies in order to create some kind of statements in order to help to the practitioners, radiology, nephrology, and nurses, in order to better interpret sometimes different indications in different contexts by different guidelines. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we leave it the last word. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Socrates Stampos, for giving us the presentation and for our panelists, Dr. Stevenson, Dr. Gallieni, Dr. Ibeas, and Dr. Yazdi for joining the panel and discussing with us today. Also, a big thank you to Kate Stevenson organizing this uh, along from the European Renal Association site with us here in Glamcan. Thank you all and have a wonderful day, night, and whatever, wherever you are. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.